Good job, guys. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you out here this morning. I want to welcome any guests and visitors we have with us. And those who are joining us online, I'm glad you're here, too. So, this morning, beautiful summer day, but it's starting to feel a little chilly out there. There's a little chill in the air. I know we get, uh, you know, you got to work kind of late in the evening sometimes. You used to come in and it'd be about quarter to ten and it would be dark. Now it's about quarter to nine and it's getting dark. So the days are shortening up a little bit. And it's getting a little cooler, so fall's on the way. So with that, though, we got a lot more activities coming again this fall. The children's church is kicking in. You know, we got other things happening, so the things are happening. So anyway, this morning, let's just... Open the service in a word of prayer and thank God for all that he does for us. God, you are an awesome God. There is none like you. God, we, we just come humbly, God, and just ask God for your hand of forgiveness, God, where we fall short and, and our busyness in life, God, that we forget to spend time with you. And, and God, but we've gathered here this morning and some are listening online, and, and God, we know you've got something for us this morning. God, for everyone that's here and listening, God, God, I just pray that our hearts would be open and receptive, God, to receive, uh, whether it's in the music, whether it's in the preaching of the word, whatever it is, God, God, I just pray that we'd be re able to receive what you'd have for us today. God, I thank you for each one who's listening and, and who's attending here. God, I thank you for each one who's participating in the service. God, those downstairs, God, that are uh, visiting yet and uh, that prepared breakfast and all who is serving. God, I just pray a blessing on each one here, God. God, I thank you for my family here. Just bless them. I ask your hand a blessing on this service. We just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We just invite you to stand this morning as we begin with some songs of worship and praise to God. And just even in this prayer line, I mentioned about how God is just an awesome God and and that's what we're going to sing this morning just to start off. It's just about how awesome the Lord is and how great and mighty he is. And again, this morning, we just invite you, if you're comfortable, clap those hands. Help us out with a little percussion. We're drummerless this morning. That doesn't matter to God. Sometimes it matters more to us. But you know what? God doesn't care about that. He just cares that our hearts come before him and that we worship him and praise him for who he is. Regardless of what instruments... Regardless of how we sing, it's our heart attitude. So let's just do that this morning. We're going to lift him up and tell him how awesome he is. Let's sing, Great Are You, Lord. Where you send us? 
Lord most high. We just lift you up today, Father. We lift you up. We lift you up.
are so worthy, Lord. Take your place, God. Just arise in our hearts and our lives and our very soul and spirit. God, arise in our country and take your place. Lord, we lift you up. We proclaim you today. We just proclaim you today. We proclaim who you are and what you've done, God. You are worthy. You are worthy, God. We just lift you up, God. We lift you up. Yes, God, you are our Lord. You are none other than you. Only you, Lord. Only you.
God, we just do believe that you are there. When we call on your name, You're my 
you love us, because you love us.
Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My so amazing to us, Lord, and we appreciate so much pouring out you did of your love, of yourself, to make sure that we knew how much you loved us. We give you this time today, Father, we ask you to continue just to work in our lives on a daily basis. That we would open up our hearts and our spirits to you and just let you do that work in us. That work of 
your amazing grace and your amazing love. Thank you, God. Thank you for this time. Thank you for who you are. We love you today, God. We love you, Father. We love you. Amen. 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 Why don't you say good morning to somebody? If you enjoy this program, we'd love to hear from you. Comments can be sent to us online or write to us at the address on your screen. If we could have the ushers come, we'd like to receive the morning offering at this time. God, we, we're thankful, God. We're thankful for as you watch over our finances, you watch over our families. You give us wisdom if we ask, Lord. So, God, we just ask for wisdom how to handle our finances. Bless each family here, I pray, God, and, and just uh, thank you for the offering and thank you for giving us jobs and thank you for giving us work. God, those that are looking for work, bless them, and, that, and we thank you for the jobs that we have. We just thank you for all you do for us. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we are receiving the offering, let's spend a few minutes run through our weekly bulletin here. Um, this morning, Pastor Tim is going to be working on 1 John, uh, part 3 of that. Um, tonight, a youth group at the Fagley's at 6 o'clock. Um, on the back page of your bulletins, uh, children, Children's Church Resumes, One Way Kids. Uh, youth and adult volunteers are still needed. So, they want to get the schedule put together. So, this Sunday is kind of the last Sunday if you want to help with the Kids Club. Uh, one Way Kids uh, Children's Church, get a hold of Lorraine. She will, uh, she'll get you signed up, and they do need help. Youth and adult volunteers, please get a hold of Lorraine today. Um, also, uh, One Way Kids puppet uh, team uh, is also seeking puppeteers. So if you are interested in that part, contact Jaina or Sue Walther about that. And they said training is available. Um, also, um, there's a trip being planned here, the Creation Museum. Uh, there was a young lady uh, that works in the, with 4-H, and they got a hold of Linda, and uh, she, she went down to this Creation Museum and was so impressed. She went with her family and said, you know, we want to open this to the, all the churches. She wants to, not just Zion Lutheran, but Zion Lutheran is the one that's putting the trip on, but... She was really impressed, and so I just want to read this. It says, Zion Lutheran Church is planning a charter trip to the Creation Museum in Pittsburgh, Kentucky. It's for all ages, and families are encouraged to attend. The Creation Museum focuses on creation, the fall, Tower of Babel, and the flood. See creationmuseum.org for, for more information. Besides visiting the museum, uh, you will be also visiting the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. The cost is $300 per person if 30, uh, 30 people attend. So they're getting a bus together. We have an information packet on the back uh, table back there. Grab that on your way out if you're interested. There's a lot of information in there about that. Um, so she was really impressed and would really just, it settled something in her spirit. She says, man, this is, this is something. So if that's something to work for you, Check that out. And also, her name down there, uh, Abby Kraus. Uh, she's an 18-year-old gal that just was really impressed. So her phone number is down there, so get a hold of her. Um, also, uh, this coming Saturday, we are having a community fundraiser. It's the Help Haiti 
fourth annual fundraiser uh, down at the People's Park. Uh, we're trying to get some funds raised for the church and the school and the orphanage over in Haiti. Uh, Pastor Leslie did send us a letter. Pastor Tim will be reading that in a little bit. But uh, let me, I'll read this. Please come and bring your family and friends and neighbors uh, to help support the Grace Assembly Fellowship Church School and Orphanage in Haiti. Uh, the picnic supper is only $5 per person. There will be a raffle and lots of gifts to be given away uh, from donations made by the area businesses. That's this coming Saturday down at the People's Park uh, at 5 o'clock. So if you could come and help support that, that would be a wonderful thing. Pastor Tim. Good morning. We are going to continue with uh, 1 John. Um, I just want to start out with uh, just a word of prayer. God, today we come before you and we, as we read your word, I pray that you would use it to challenge us. I pray, God, that you would use it to challenge our hearts. I pray that you would use it to take us from where we're at to where you want us to be at. God, I pray that you would open it, open your word up to us. I pray that you would reveal it to our hearts, cause it to be alive. Cause it to be alive, God, in a way that we've never seen it. Lord, I just ask your blessing on your word this morning. Father, I ask you to bring life through your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I'm going to read a passage of this 1 John chapter 2. It's not up on the screen. Um, I just want you to listen to it. I want you to hear this. 1 John chapter 2. Don't, don't even bother turning there. If you have your Bibles, just listen. John says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We have one. John says, one of the reasons that I write this letter to you is so that you don't sin. But if you do, if you do, I told you a little bit about our dogs last week. I'm going to tell you another story about our dogs. We have two dogs, and we thought we had one cat. We found out this week that we have two dogs and one cat and two kittens. <laughs> the family's growing. And my daughter's bringing me water. God bless you. <clears throat> so I told you last week that the big dog... And the little dogs start fighting and eventually the big dog just chews on the little dog's head. And then the little dog, when he can't fight anymore, just goes and chews on the cat's head. And so this week, one of our big dog has a tendency of running off and disappearing for an hour or two hours. And you know that when the big dog disappears for two hours, he takes the little dog with him. So what I decided to do, what we decided to do was to buy a training collar. You know, you really ought to read the directions very, very closely before you use one of these. So we bought the training collar for the dog. And I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk the dog to the boundaries that I want the dog to go to. And then this training collar has a couple of different settings. The first setting is tone. It just does a tone. And I, I mean, I hit it and I, I can hear it. But the dog just is like, whoa, what's that? You know, it's just as confusing. Oh, so. So I put the collar on the dog and I set it to tone. And we started walking the edges of the property where I wanted the dog to go. And I hit the tone and nothing happened. And I thought, it's defective. And so we're going along and I hit tone and nothing happened. And so I thought, well, I'm going to... So, so I left it down on this very lowest setting and I thought I'm going to hit zap one time. I'm just going to zap him and see if that makes a difference. And nothing happened. So I thought this thing is, it's either faulty or the dog is really tough. So I cranked it up to two and then I cranked it up to three and then I cranked, it goes up to seven. 
Well, I stopped at about five, and I thought, what is the matter with this crazy thing? And then I looked, and the collar was too loose. It's got two probes that have to be there. So, so I tightened the collar up a little bit and got both probes in contact with the skin. And we're walking along, and I hit tone, and all of a sudden, the tone is there. And I'm thinking, this is, this is good. The, I hear the tone, but the dog just keeps on walking, so I thought, well, I'll hit the button for zap. I didn't turn it down, though. The poor dog came right about off the ground. <laughs> just going after its own neck. Trying, I mean, I lifted. The dog has got to be 80 pounds. He came right up off the ground, just trying to figure it out. And I thought, well, what did I do? You know, so, and I figured it out. So I turned it way back down to about three. And we walked all around the property. And every time I hit tone, that dog responded. Came right back to me. Right back to me. We got down by the house and the dog was still confused as to why this thing was around his neck. And so I opened the door to the house and he bolted in, just about knocked me down. And I've had him, he's been really good lately, he hasn't done that, but he just about knocked me down. Took my knees out, you know. And so I got mad and I'm like, get out of the house. And we're going back and forth. And I thought, I'll get you. And I zapped him again. You know, again, you really ought to read the book. See, there are people out there who have compassion for dogs. They're like, no, don't do that to the dog. So finally the dog was confused and took off through the house. It just did not work the way it was supposed to work. So finally I got the dog back outside and then the dog disappeared. I thought, where's the dog at? The little dog was around so I know that he didn't run away. In my garage I have a workbench that's probably about so high and underneath that workbench I have a dresser and in that dresser I have all kinds of tools stored and there's a space about this wide behind the dresser. And that's where the dog was. Oof, got in there, couldn't turn around. And finally I'm out there calling and the dog backs out. You see his tail come out first and then his butt and then his head. Like, you still got that remote, I'm not coming out. So finally I got the dog out there. And I said to myself, okay, you know what, I gotta put this remote away. That is stupid. I'm gonna kill the dog before I figure out how to, what my part is in it. And so I put the remote down and, and I got down on the ground and started playing with the dog and we started playing fetch and the next thing you know the dog is coming back around. Took him out for a walk a little bit later and I took the button with me and we got out there and I hit tone and he came right back and we were off here and he took off and I hit tone and he came right back. The dog for the last 24 hours at least has not taken off, he's hung around the house. This morning I thought he was gone and so I hit tone, I held the, the receiver up and I hit the tone and within seconds he comes bailing out of the woods, he's right there. You know, sometimes we sin. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes we, we really miss the mark. As young believers... As young believers, often we sin. We just don't quite have this God thing down. And sometimes when that young believer sins, us older believers who happen to have control of the remote, we come down so hard that we, that we, that we scare them, we, we damage them, we hurt them. You can't do that. You're a Christian. Ba ba ba. And John says, I write this to you so that you don't sin, but if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. Folks, I want to challenge you. You're involved in young people's lives. You're involved in people's lives who are young in the Lord. Make sure that you're listening to the advocate. Make sure that you read the manual. Make sure that, that we, we get on their side. Make sure that we understand. We have a couple of verses here in Scripture that we're going to read this morning. And, and my whole intent this week, this past couple of weeks, was I'm just going to kind of blow through this passage of Scripture. When we get there, I didn't think there was much to it. But this week, God has just opened it up to me in a way that I can't even quite wrap my brain around it. You've seen pictures of families where there's multi-generations, there's great-grandma, and then there's grandma, and then there's the mom, and then there's, the, you might have, well, wait, a couple of weeks ago, we had five generations sitting here. It's an amazing picture. Typically, it's the 
patriarch or the matriarch and they've, they've lived a long time and they've worked hard raising the family. And now they're able to enjoy this relationship. There's a comfort. There's a peace. There's a, there's a fellowship that just happens because the grandkids just want to go and be with grandma. Or they want to go and be, want to hang around grandpa. They just love that relationship. And then there's the adult children. They're a little bit younger. Maybe they're in their prime. They're working, raising their own families. They've got their, their jobs. They've got the things going on in life. Trying to teach their kids. They've got probably the most amount of energy they'll ever have in their life. And this one over here is for the grandma. Or for the grandpa. I got some props today. May not help you, but I might need this chair in an hour. And then you got the grandkids. They're young. They don't do a whole lot of work yet. They're just enjoying being around grandma and grandpa. They're enjoying being around mom and dad. Have you ever seen those pictures? Have you ever seen that unfold? I'm going to be a grandpa for the first time here in a few months. That's not right. I mean, I love you, but I don't feel like I should be a grandpa yet. But I will be and it's going to be okay. I'm going to be a grandpa. Did you hear that? Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Alex. <laughs> John chapter, 1 John chapter 2. Starting in verse 12. John says, I write to you, dear, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Not on account of anything you've done. On account of his name. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Then John goes on and he says, I write to you dear children because you have known the father. Well, he just said that. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Now, in Hebrew writing, they didn't use all caps, okay? They didn't use bold. They didn't use extra colors. If they wanted to emphasize something, they didn't even use exclamation points. If you look at my notes, you'll find when I, when I do a sermon, when I do my outline, everything that I want on the screen is in red. Usually all my scriptures, they're in red. If I have scriptures that I want to read, but I don't want them on the screen, they're in blue. If I have something I want to make sure that I get to, it's in bold. I have things broken up in paragraphs so that I can always get back. I can walk away from my notes and in just a matter of a few seconds because of how I've developed my system for preaching, I can get back to about where I was in just a few seconds pretty, pretty easily. Well, the writers of the New Testament didn't have that. So when they wanted to emphasize something, what they did was they repeated it. It's called parallelism. It's what it is. It's a form of Hebrew poetry. And so they repeat it. So these are a couple of verses that I just wanted to blow by. And as I was praying about it this week, I felt like the Lord said to me, you know what? I had John repeat it because it's important. I want you to get a hold of it. Don't just blow by these verses. I had him repeat it to grab a hold of it. So John says, he begins to address three types or three groups of individuals in this section. He addresses the children, he addresses the young men, and then he addresses fathers. And I think in our culture, in our society, we, we don't quite grab a hold of the value maybe of this. I believe that what John is speaking to is he's speaking to people who are at different stages in their Christian walk. I don't think he's really talking to little babies. I don't think he's really talking to, to five-year-olds that are sitting in their, in their high chair or four-year-olds. That's not why. I, I think he's speaking to young Christians. You ever known a young Christian? You ever been a young Christian? Three, four, five. Maybe we've got to preach a salvation message. We're not born 
We're not brought into the kingdom with all this great wisdom. How many of you know grandpas have wisdom? Five of you. This is participatory, okay? You can be involved. I went to a church one time. I had to preach there. And there was a sign right out front in the parking lot. And it said, this spot is reserved for the pastor. If you want to preach, you can park here. There was participation going on. So that's why I parked. I had to preach anyhow. I believe John was looking at three specific groups of people. And they're at different places in their life. So first we see that John addresses the children. The children, I believe, are new believers. He addresses these new believers to encourage them. He's just finished talking about sin. That's what I just, just read about. He just finished talking about sin. And he is addressing a specific problem that they had in their culture in this day about people who did not believe fully in Jesus, did not believe in the redemptive work that he did, did not believe... Actually, again, I've shared this, but what they believed was that you can sin all you want in your body as long as you've had this spiritual experience because the flesh is, is evil anyhow. So you can go ahead and keep on sinning. It doesn't make any difference. And as we shared last week, John corrected that. He's like, wait a minute. This means something different. You, you've got to grab a hold of this. So John recognizes that you know, we, there's this place where we're, where we're dear, dear children. And, and again, chapter 2 and, and verse 12 says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. It always grabs my heart that, that our sins have been forgiven, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done on account of his name, not on account of my name. John wants to encourage them who have truly received Christ that your sins are forgiven. If you're a newer Christian, I think there are times when you need to be reminded. You know why? Because you've got those old habits. You've got those old thoughts. You've got those old patterns that, are, that are, you struggle with, that we struggle with. We've got those old things that we've got to get rid of. And we need to be reminded, sometimes on a daily basis, God forgave you of that. Christ forgave you of that. For his sake, not for your sake. You say, well, but I still, I still fall into that sin on occasion. Great. God forgave you of that. We take this picture, and I can see Grandpa sitting over in a chair with little Johnny climbing up on his knee. And maybe he's had to reprimand little Johnny for something. But you know what? Grandpa still loves you. Dad still loves you. Even though you did that wrong, God still loves you. This young believer needs to be encouraged sometimes on a daily basis that God still loves them. God still cares about them. And sometimes I'm afraid that we come down on young believers with the heavy hand of the, of the, of the button. You know, I'm, I'm jacked up on seven or eight. And we're going to let them know that that's not, that's not acceptable. <laughs> As I started to read through the manual on training dogs, you know, it came with a manual. I decided to read it after I about tore the dog apart. It says, you never want your dog with his ears down and his tail down for very long. That means he's afraid. This is crazy. This is crazy. You know some of the research did? Dog, when a, when, a, when a dog is satisfied and is comfortable, when they sit next to you, they'll stick their tongue out and sigh. And I thought, I'm reading through this, I'm thinking, I don't, I never saw that, you know. After about a day and a half of working with the dog, and I finally got him to sit next, you know what he did? He sat down, tongue out, <sighs> this is crazy. Somebody actually watched dogs to know that. What about young Christians? I don't expect them to sit down with their tongue out and sigh, maybe. But what I do expect is they're not terrified to be around other Christians. They're not terrified that somebody's going to... I just talked to somebody the other day and this gal was saying something about some sin in her life and she said, I, don't, I can't even imagine going to church because if I go to church I'm afraid there's going to be a prophet there's going to pull me out and expose this sin in my life. And she's a young Christian and I thought, you know what, God loves you. He loves you. She needed to be reminded that, yeah, you... You sin, but you've got an advocate with the Father. John wants to encourage 
that young Christian. Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 8 and verse 9. It says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that anyone can boast. We don't accept Christ on our... We don't get to the point of accepting Christ because of what we've done. It's grace that he has given us, each one of us. And you and I know, as maybe a little bit older Christians, we know that if it wasn't for the grace of God, none of us would make it. None of us would. We blow it. We blow it. John says, I write this to you so that you don't sin, but if you do. I don't know about you, but after I accepted Jesus, there were many times I needed that if you do. I needed that. Today, I need that. I need to know that if I sin, there is an advocate. One of the, well, we, well, I forget it. New believers, he not only reminds us that their sins are forgiven, but also that God loves them so much. That's what the second, the second time he repeats it. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. Sometimes we get confused and we, and we teach people, well, if you accept Jesus, then nothing, then nothing bad's ever going to happen again. If you accept Jesus, life's going to be a better world. Anybody ever heard that sermon? I could call that heresy. That is not true. That's not true. You accept Jesus, guess what? You're still going to have hard days. Right? You accept Jesus, there's still going to be things in your life that come up that you go, I don't want to deal with that. You're still going to have days when you don't want to look in the mirror. But there's an advocate. There is one who is advocating for you. He's on your side. His name is Jesus. He's having a conversation with the Father. And he's telling the Father, look, I gave my life for him. I poured my blood on him. He's been, he's, he received Christ. He's received me. So you've got to look at him like you look at me, God. That should bring hope to us. That should bring hope to us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, the second half of verse 13. John says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Listen to this. They've been, they've been tested. They've been tempted. They've overcome. Have you ever been in that place where you feel like you finally, man, you overcame something? You know, when I accepted Christ, I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I can stand here today and tell you that since that time, since I accepted Christ, when God delivered me, when God set me free, I have not had a cigarette since then in over 30 years. I have not had a cigarette. I overcame. By the blood and by the power of Jesus, I overcame. So those young men are, are strong men. They're people who are, are acquainted with God's word. They're, they're, they're growing up. You ever seen your kids grow up and start to take more responsibility? We have somebody in our congregation this morning, Jessica. She thought I forgot about her. I'm going to ask Jessica to come up here. Jessica Putbreeze is no longer a child over here. She's grown up. And she leaves in just a few days on the 10th, September 10th. She's going into the military to protect our country. And you signed up for eight years, is that right? Seven. Seven? And when you leave, you're going to be gone for? Six months. Six months. With option of deployment. With option of deployment. So you know what? This is the real deal. She's gone from this stage to this stage. You think about that in Christianity. She's taken a step where she's grown up. I'm going to ask Dad to come up here too. <coughs> Should have known that one's coming. <laughs> Because we're going to pray over her. Father, we just thank you for Jessica. And I'm going to ask you to stretch your arms out towards Jessica. God, we ask for Jessica. We ask, God, first of all, that your protection would be around her. That, God, you would set angels around her. We go into boot camp thinking this is going to be a great time. But the reason for boot camp is to break a person down. And so, God, I pray that as that all takes place and she... She becomes conformed to the image that the military wants her, that she'd still stay conformed to the image that you want for her. God, I just pray your protection over her mind and over her heart. 
Lord, we, Lord, we just pray for safety for her. Pray for mom and dad as, as she steps out and she goes, God, that there'd be no fear, there'd be no anxiety. God, we just place Jessica in your hands and we ask you, Father, to, to use her in ways that she never thought possible, to grow her up, to mature her. And Lord, we again, we just ask for that protection, for that safety around about her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. Give me a hug. <laughs> God never intended us to stay children. He intended for us to grow up. There's something about this group of people in the church that I think we misunderstand. And what I think we need to understand about this group of people in the church is that even around the house, you're not going to get a whole lot of work out of a little kid, right? No. Nope. Sometimes even as a young teen, we don't get a whole lot of work. They're, they're making that transition. When you come to this point in your life, when you come to this point in your walk in Christianity, there's a load, there's a work, there's stuff that we have to do. Do you know who... I, this is what God's just been burning in my heart this week. Do you know who carries the load of the church? I mean, Jesus carries the load of the church, but he uses this group of believers right here, maybe the most. When we came back from Mexico, John Fagley said, you know, one of the things I realized is that some of us got to grow up and grab a hold of the plow. That wasn't exactly it, but that was it. We got to grow up and take our place in the church. This is where the work... Because, because we've grown up. We've come to this place. It's... You know, we, we live in a, in a culture where we have way too many people in this gamut, this section of life that the government takes care of. They don't have to work. They don't have to. They just kind of sit on the wall for the you know, uh, that, that was too hard. I got blisters. I can't do that. Well, I'd really like to use, uh, that shovel's too short. I'd like to do that. I can't do that. A mop. I've never been on the business end of a mop. I can't do that. You know, we cannot allow that to be in the church. We can't allow that. That group of people that Paul is, that, that John is talking to here, young men, I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. You've overcome. Now God has got something for us. Does that make sense to us? You know what happens in churches? This is, this is the, one of the greatest fears of preachers. I just, it's it, we call it second generation Christians and I've, I've shared this before. It's like mom and dad have come when, when mom and dad were young and they accepted the Lord and they got to this point and there was nothing going on for churches and mom and dad, they dug in, man. They're going to get it done. They're going to get it done. They're going to get people to come to Jesus. They're going to make church happen. All of a sudden you have churches like Christian Fellowship that spring up out of no place because somebody grabbed hold of a shovel, because somebody grabbed hold of a hole, because somebody grabbed hold of the Word of God and said, we're going to go out and evangelize. We're going to go out and tell people about Jesus. And then you get the church full of people and their kids come up and they come through the ranks. And as mom and dad transition from here to here, as they go from this, this worker to the Father in the Lord, Ah, the kids are sitting back over here going, I'm not really sure I want to do that. They haven't grabbed a hold of it. I had a friend who had a business, and, and this man was going to, he actually offered to sell me the business at one point. And so we kind of worked out a deal, and then it all fell through, and he gave it to his kids, his two sons. His uh, one son was, was just a year younger than I am, and the other son was about my age. And so he was going to give it to his sons. And as he was going to give that over to his sons, he let them run it for a year without really giving it over to them. And in that period of time, everything fell apart. You know why? It's because they never grew up. They never learned how to take this position. They never learned how to take the tools and say, you know what, we're going to make this as ours. Instead, they walked around and said, well, this is ours. 
And I think, so I think, you know, the old man's making all this money. The first thing I think we need to do is we need to buy new trucks. And then we should all have uniforms. And then, you know what, I think we should do it this way, and I think we should, and they never learned how to grab a hold of the shovel. Christians, we need to grab a hold of the shovel. If you're here and you see yourself in this position, man, you've got to have a shovel in your hand. Or you've got to have a hole. Or you've got to have a mop. When I came here, I was absolutely convinced that one of the first things the Lord told me to do was to stop all programming except Sunday morning. Stop it all. Don't do anything other than Sunday morning. Until the people of this congregation rise up and say, this is what we need and we're going to own it. This is, what we're, this is what we need. We need to reach out. To, you realize that this group, this group of young men, this, young men and women, this, he's not just talking to men, he's talking to believers, young believers. This is the group that understands the connection between this generation and this generation. They're the ones who understand this is what we've got to do. As parents, you may not be able to speak your kid's language. I mean, the whole thing about texting. I, I got it now, but I didn't want it. I mean, that was the last. When my daughter got a cell phone, I said, okay, how many minutes do you need? Oh, you know, out of just minimal minutes. I'm thinking, well, why are we getting a cell phone here? She's like, well, I could, I, you know, I can get by with just a couple hundred minutes. But the first bill I looked at was 12,000 texts. I don't even understand that. How do you do that? 12,000 texts. If I were to look now at that same bill for me, I'm betting I'd be several thousand and my kids are going, yeah, that would. You know when you try to get a hold of me, Dad, and you hit that thing 15 times? Every one of those is a text. We have to, we have to bridge that gap. We have a generation of people that coming up that do things different, they think different, but they still need Jesus just as bad as we did. And I'm telling you that the, the bulk of that load needs to come from young men, young women who have gotten Jesus Christ in their heart and they're satisfied in that and they've, they've overcome the enemy. You know what? They're starting to walk that walk. That's us. Most of us are there. We don't just get to sit by and see if it happens. Because it doesn't just happen. Here's the problem with that same generation. Now you're going, oh, sure, now you're just going to pick on me. We go out and we do this for ourselves, our jobs, and, you know, we make a lot of money, and then all of a sudden we decide, instead of putting that money into the church or investing that into our relationships, we're going to go on vacation, and there's nothing wrong with a vacation. We worked hard, and so now we're going to play hard. But you know what? At what point are we going to work hard for Christ as well? I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm not going to apologize, Okay. Because I believe it's what God is calling us to. He's saying, you know what? If we're going to do this thing, we've got to grow up and do it. And we have been so long relying on older men. Older men. God is speaking. John is speaking to an older generation. He's saying, older men, you're in a different spot. You've rested in the Lord. Man, you're there. You've known God from the beginning. You started out young. You've come through this phase. And now you've rested. And that's not a rest where we put our feet up and get in a rocking chair. Ooh, this is not really a rocker, so I don't want you to just retire and die in a rocking chair. That's not what I'm saying. But if you look at what the Bible has to say about elders, we got a way screwed up idea in the church about what elders are. Okay, elders aren't just the guys that run the business of the church. Elders are guys like Jim Erb and like Alan Schoenberger, like Barry Schroeder and like Sharon Schroeder and like Verda Erb and like Robbie Schoenberger. And do I just keep going Marlis Eiley? Do I just keep, I mean, what do I do? They're people who understand the goodness of God. They're people who said, you know what? In all things, I know that God is good through it all, through it all. And they're the ones who should be standing Alongside of these guys saying, you know what? It'll work. You, that's the pointed end. That's the one that goes in the ground. And this is the one that goes in your left hand. And this, this is how that works. And you just keep digging, son. That's going to be good. And they're the ones that grab the babies on their laps. And they say, okay, you know what? I know you blew it. But Jesus loves you. 
And you know what happens in the church? Somehow we get this twisted idea that they should just retire and go away. And I don't think that's God's heart. I don't think that's God's heart. How many times have you all, I mean, here we have a whole bunch of people here in this church that call Jim or Grandpa Jim, and he isn't related to any of us. Anybody that he's not related to ever called him Grandpa? I've heard it a thousand times. Don't tell me you haven't done it. It's not just his grandkids that call him that. Because he's got that grandfatherly nature that wants to help nurture the body along. But you know what? Jim is no longer in the driving chair. He's no longer the one that should be out here with the shovel digging every, every week. He's no longer that person. I think in these verses, John is speaking to us saying, you know what? There's more to this thing. This is a, a multi-generational. It, it crosses those boundaries. I want us to work together. I want you to see the young people coming in, new, fresh in the Lord, being encouraged. I write to you, young men, because you're strong. Because you're strong. They're not strong in themselves. Their strength doesn't come from going to the club and working out. That strength comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from the fact that they have persevered through trials. They've seen this thing work. They've, they started out young, and now they're just a little bit more mature. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of all the surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. This is Paul. This is a guy who wrote most of the New Testament. And he said, to keep me from getting all fluffed up and all puffed up, thinking I got it all done, there was a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulty. For when I am weak, then he is strong. Paul says, I realize that when I'm out there digging and when things aren't going my way, you know what? It doesn't make any difference because my strength, my hope, my life is in Christ. Amen. That's where it comes from. And I would bet, I would bet we could find some older believer standing behind him, encouraging him on, saying, you know what, you need to go, you're right. You need to go, you're right, this is good stuff. I get it, you're in jail. Matter of fact, if you read through Paul's books, you'll find he was often encouraged by others. There was somebody standing behind him saying, it's tough, I get it. You say to yourself, you know what, I don't, I don't like doing church work. It's hard work, I get it. It's hard work. But we don't get to jump from here to there. We don't get to go from infant to sitting on, I'm not going to say sitting on the sidelines because that isn't where I want this chair either. Sometimes, sometimes these guys over here get really discouraged because it feels like, uh, I'm done, there's nothing left for me to do. I, you know, I, 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 nobody listens to me anymore. I, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Dave and Vonnie Seberg are invaluable to the body of Christ. Yeah. Red and Gladys Varberg are invaluable to the body of Christ. Jim and Verda Herb are invaluable to the body of Christ. There is so much knowledge. There is so much wisdom. There is so much life there for the body of Christ. I wanted to skip right past these three verses, but I felt that God just, just you, we need to grab a hold of this. This group right here is, it becomes, by default, becomes the driving force of the church. What's the vision of the church? What's the direction of the church? Where are we headed? Where are we going? This is the group. This is the group, along with God's word, that determines where we're headed, whether we're plugged in or not. Scripture says of the pastor that God has called some to be evangelists, pastors, evangelists, pastors, teachers, uh, you know it, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. To, to do not, not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Right? Yes. 
Equip the saints to do the work. of the, It's our responsibility. If you find yourself and you say, well, I'm in that chair. That's who I am. Hop on. Jump on. Be there. Be that person that's doing the work of the ministry. Not in your own strength. We can't do that. And I'm, boy, I sure hope you don't hear me and say, well, you know, so-and-so is too old. They got to go over there. They're too young. They can't do it. And we, we do this together. It's a body. It's a body. We work together. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and because the word of God lives in you and you've overcome the evil one. Remember last week? It started out three weeks ago and then last week I hit it again. And people say, you know what? It's just me and Jesus and the church is such a mess. I can't really go there. It's just me and I'm, that, that's, I'm, not, I'm not doing formalized church anymore. Where does that fit? How does that fit a body? It doesn't fit a body. It's through abiding in God's word. It's through reading it. It's through studying it. It's through living it. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that believers mature. We go through this process. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, it's, it's like you've tasted, you've seen it, God's good. God loves you. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 through 14 says, you need milk, not meat. The writer of Hebrews is actually admonishing people. He's admonishing people that should be in this chair. And he's saying, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The writer of Hebrews says, it's your own discipline that's going to get you there. That's how you're going to go from point A to point B. It's your own, it, by constant use, by discipline in God's word, by knowing God's word, by studying God's word, by, by, by applying God's word to your life, by living it out, that's how you're going to go from point A to point B. That's how we're going to get there. And when we're there, we're not there just to take up room in a pew. That stinks. I mean, we don't get to be here and go, you know, I'm just coming to get, you know, y'all take care of Sunday morning, that'd be good. Y'all take care of VBS, that'd be good. If somebody else wants to take care of evangelism, that'd be good. If someone wants to get the garbage out or, you know, put new windows in the church, that'd be good. That's us, folks. That's us. I tried to tell the the team the, of people who got together this morning, I tried to tell them this morning a little bit about what I was going to speak on and I just I felt like I just wanted to cry because I think God wants to see us moving forward as a body and that's going to take us moving forward as a body. I wish I could just say it's my job you all don't got to worry about it and the worst part is that's kind of my nature. <laughs> I take on stuff like that and I just do it. And I know somebody's pointing their fingers at me going, look at that. That's my nature. I, want it, I, I have a hard time saying, well, you know. But God wants to grow each one of us up. We have a letter. I, Lonnie said I was going to share a letter from Pastor Leslie. You know, we supported him for a while and, and Lonnie's been doing this Haiti ride. Listen to what he shares. Dear Brother Lonnie, blessings to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you and your family doing? I would, I'm going to add a few words because I think that's what he wanted. I would like to take this opportunity to address with you some issues concerning that which I am going through right now. First of all, I would like to thank you for your prayers, for your love, for your support that I've been getting from you for a while ago. Your blessing has impacted a lot in our life in Haiti. You know, we seem to forget that there was a pretty massive earthquake in Haiti some four or five years ago. And we get past the initial shock on TV and we forget about it. But friends I've got who go to Haiti say it's not even remotely back. Thanks to God, our ministry, our orphanage is doing well in Haiti. The main purpose of this letter is to inform you with some difficulties that we are actually experiencing in the orphanage in Haiti. I have recently been in trouble feeding the kids in the orphanage. 
I can't even feed them with one meal a day due to that situation. I was planning to close the orphanage, but I don't want to see the children in the street. I'm writing this letter in order how you can address your church to help us in Haiti with the orphanage. I hope that you will think about the children in Haiti as you get, as you get used to uh, do so for us in Haiti. I'm not sure. May God bless you and your family. I look forward to hearing from you very soon. And we were able to send some money as a church. But here's a guy who's sitting in this chair and in speaking with other missionaries who are very well respected in GCMF, they say, Leslie is a great guy. He's doing a great work. He's an apostle. He oversees several churches. He walks to all these churches. And here they can't feed their kids once a day in an orphanage. We have an opportunity. That's somebody who's, who's doing it. His feet are on the ground. We have an opportunity to bless them. The motorcycle ride is just a fundraiser. It's just a way to bless them. It's open to the community. It's open to the church. We're going to Take an offering next week, or if you get hold of Lonnie this week and say, you know what, we want to bless them. The sermon is not a setup for that. It's just a perfect example of there's somebody who's doing it. There's somebody who's got his, his shovel in the ground and he's doing it. And they can't feed their kids in their orphanage even one meal a day. When, when we go out for supper several times a week if we want to, Mature believers abide in God's word. They live righteous lives. They're taking roles of leadership and serving. John 15, 5 says, If a man remains or abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I think when we talk about the fathers that John is talking about, we're talking about those believers who've stayed the course. There's been great fruit in their life. The fruit is that they've led people to Christ. They've discipled people. Jim Herb called me the other day and he said, I've got a couple of young couples that want to go through a Bible study. And so he started a Bible study for a couple of young couples. That's taking that grandfather role. That's taking that elder role in the church. That's what that is. The challenge for us today as we read through the Word of God is, what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with it? Are we going to are we going to plug in? Are we going to say, oh, I got to figure out how. We were at this last conference. I saw an amazing, we'll show a video someday. This guy took a, he made a bridge like off the back of a guitar. It's called an earth harp is what he called it. So on a guitar, this is the bridge right back here. Right back here. So he made this bridge. And the bridge was probably about 10 feet wide, I suppose. And it was anchored to the floor. And he was in a building that had to be probably 150, 200 feet back to this, this second level of chairs, of seating. And these strings went from the ground across this bridge up to that second level. They were anchored up to the balcony. The first time this guy made this instrument, he actually did it outside in kind of a natural amphitheater and he anchored the strings to the rock here and to the rock on a cliff and it was over a thousand feet long. So in this church, he's got this set up, these strings are going everywhere and he climbs in the middle of them and he's got gloves on and on those gloves he's got violin rosin and he sat there and he played that instrument. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And when he got done, he said, 
They were talking to me. He said, I want you all to know that you're sitting in the instrument. You're sitting in the earth harp. Even more than that, you're part of the tone of it. You're part of the sound of this instrument. You realize that that's what the church is? Whether the, whether the body of Christ comes off looking like this, this amazing help to our community around us, or if we walk away looking like we don't care at all and Jesus has no meaning to us, that's part of us. That's part of a reflection of us. We're part of that instrument. We're part of that body. We are that body. I wish I could just close. I wish I could just say, here's the, here's the bottom line. This is what I want to get to. But I, it's... It just, it just feels so big in my spirit that I feel like I, I can't even say that. The, the, the goal, and I think what God's word is saying to us today, is that this thing called the church doesn't happen without us. It does not happen. But we got to take our spots. We got to take our spots. Nobody gets to retire. That easy chair over there is not for retirement. That easy chair over there is for pulling a grandkid up on your knee. That's what it's there for. The easy chair is so you can rest a little bit and get, you can stand up behind the guy who's carrying the shovel and say, I'm going to bring you a glass of water and we need to keep moving. The easy chair is there to get some rest so that you can get back up and encourage somebody to keep, maybe give them some more direction. But we've got we to gotta follow after what God wants us to do as a church, as a body. That makes sense? Not the house, it's the church is not the house, it's the people. It's us. It's us. Let's pray. <coughs> Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak to people's hearts in a way that you've spoken to mine this week. God, I ask you to to convict and to challenge. I ask you to encourage and to exhort. I ask you to chasten if need be. But Lord, we need to find our place, our role. We need to find our mission in this community. And I think, God, you are speaking that to us. And we need to rise up and take our places and move forward. I ask you, Father, to continue by the power of your Holy Spirit to draw infants in, to draw in people to this building, draw people into our lives, draw people into our relationships that need to hear the truth about Jesus Christ. And then help us to be that driving force Help us to be that person who is willing to say, this is the truth about Christ. Give us that boldness and that courage. Help us, Father, to encourage people when they sin, when they blow it, when they miss it. Help us to encourage them and not to beat them up. Help us to speak life and not death. The gospel is the good news. You paid the price. That's the good news, God. That is the good news. We can't work our way into heaven. The good news is you paid that price already. Help us not to become critical and harsh and stale and cold. God, I ask that you'd bring life to us through your word. Challenge us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let God challenge you. Continue to read through 1 John. Let God challenge you through his word. Amen. Thanks for joining us for today's broadcast. You are also invited to join us in person Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. If you enjoy this program, we'd love to hear from you. Comments can be sent to us online or write to us at the address on your screen.
Thanks again for joining us. See you next week.